super busy trying to get everything back in order. Yeah. What's your timeline on on, on editing? I I would like to get it done by. Well, we're going to the fall. I think winter, maybe winter twenty, early winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if not late winter, it's kind of my hope. Yeah. Well, that'd be the ten year kind of mark too, right? right? And I told the folks <clears throat> down at the. Uh, Oh gosh, the Southern oh, is it the Southern Ohio Cultural Center mm -hmm. or museum? All right. Uh, they let use some photographs. If they could have a premiere down there. Oh boy. Do you want to come back for that? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a premiere anywhere we can have it. You know, mm -hmm. Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. I know it. It still has a it's a lot of legs up here, and that people yeah. always ask me, especially the folks that I serve with during yeah. that period of time. So what happened? Whatever happened? Because it is an interesting story. Yeah. Well, very interesting, and um, I don't know if this is the case or not, but it being in that garage kind of locked away, I think people in Kentucky pretty much have forgotten about it. Sure. Or never really knew about it to begin with, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Select few, people who were involved with it knew. But, right. But, yeah, well, hopefully maybe somebody will see this and help it get the rock get somewhere where people can appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, off from the top here, uh, Tell us your name and the role you had back in 2007 and 2008 when all the issues over the rock began. Well, my name's Todd Book, and I was the state representative for the 89th House District back in 2007, 2008. Uh, that district encompassed all of Scioto County and portions of Adams and Lawrence counties. I was also the assistant minority leader for uh, my caucus at that time. So what did you know of Indian Head Rock before uh, it was removed from the river. Did you know any of the local histories about the rock previous? Well, I, w I wish I could say that I did, uh, but I didn't. Um, and, I, and I would say most of the people in the community were the same way. Um, after the fact, I think a lot of people tried to act just like everybody was at certain special events, you know, uh, that they had some history or some knowledge of it. But I, I think in many respects it was it was lost to history. Um, and now, in looking back, there obviously were a lot of signs out there and there were a few people that were very interested but I'd say by and large including myself it was it was lost. Yeah, it was about 80 years or so since anyone had saw it. Mm -hmm. So Lock and Dan was in. So uh, you know being from Southern Ohio and knowing Southern Ohio history did the rock seem to be more of a historical part of Portsmouth's past or Greenup County's past or South Shore or whatever you well, want to Well now it. looking back on it you know just from um, it is mentioned quite a bit in the Portsmouth historic record. Um, and back in the 1800s, there were people that were gathering in Portsmouth to view this rock. And maybe that was because there was a village on the on the north shore of the river and not on the south, or maybe it wasn't as, as substantial. But historically, there's a lot of references to Portsmouth and being Portsmouth involved in, in the... Um, and some of the names, most of the names on the rock are associated with Portsmouth. Uh, one gentleman I heard during our discussions while this was all going on is this, clearly there's nobody from Kentucky that had anything to do with this rock. Uh, they didn't, there's no X's on, on the rock to, to show their signature or their, their initials. Um, and I thought that was kind of funny. Um, some of the uh, books I read, um, Squire and Davis, some areas of publications actually referred to it as Portsmouth Indian Head Rock. Mm -hmm. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but the rock histories uh, you found post the issues with the rock, what did you find interesting? I know there was, uh, Steve Schaefer thought possibly some of your family had ties to some of the carvings or the names. Yeah, that, that's how he kind of sucked me into this. And I, I, I've really gotten to know Steve through this process and think he's a great guy. And um, thinking the whole grand scheme of things, he was really trying to do good and um, probably got portrayed in a bad way. But yeah, he came to my office as a state representative um, to to mention this to me. I, I'm not sure the dates, but it was a few months before I got involved. And he came in and said, look, these people are wanting to, these people being Kentucky, they, they want to indict me. They're really upset that this rock has been taken out of the river. And um, in many respects, I looked at it and I said, Steve, I didn't tell him this, but it was like, Steve, it's kind of like you created this little problem. Um I'll help you where I can, but obviously uh, this is your, uh, this is something you want to do, so um, I guess kind of deal with it. A month or so later, he comes back to me and says, look, 
you've got a connection to this rock, whether you know it or not. And I said, well, tell me about that. And he goes on to tell me about uh, and produces a newspaper article saying that this head that was carved on the rock was actually done by a young man named, named Johnny Book from Portsmouth. And they talk about where he was from in the newspaper article and that he went over and carved this with, uh, with a chisel or whatever else to this face. And that kind of piqued my interest because, well, you know, that's interesting. I honestly, unfortunately, didn't know really my family history that well and even whether we were in the community back in the 1800s when this was allegedly happening. So it was kind of interesting for me and kind of sparked some interest to say, well, let's find out more about this. So that's really how I got involved and started to, to look into the situation. Um, after the rock was removed from the river and after the rock kind of made its uh, first landing, if you will, in, in the Portsmouth area. Uh, is that when you met Steve Schaefer for the first time? Yeah, I had actually, I mean, I guess from, you know, putting this all together, he had found the rock in 2002 after a few years of looking for it. He spent some summers, uh, I think to his own health detriment because of some ear issues, yeah. trying to find this, trying to find this rock. And um, he must have the patience of a rock because he, he spent three years doing it, trying to find it. And he finally found it. And he told everybody about it after he found it and was very excited that he found this rock. He told Kentucky and he told Ohio and I think told the Corps of Engineers. And I think everybody was just like, well, so what? You, f you found this rock. Um, that all happened and was in the newspaper, but I never really picked up on it. I, 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 um, it wasn't something that was on the, on the front of my radar at that time. Uh, after meeting with Steve Schaefer and knowing the scope of the charges levied against him, I believe he had like a 15-year possible sentence at one point over the rock, uh, and, and the diver, Dave Vetter, um, what was the view of the rock and kind of Steve from the Portsmouth side after all of this, the charges started to happen? Well, you know, whenever he first was charged in it, I, I think a lot of people were just, there was some disbelief in that how could, um, this be taken so seriously, in essence. Uh, this is, I mean, I understand there the, the Kentucky's concerns and that, you know, you do have historic artifacts and that you do want to protect those, and I completely appreciate, appreciate that, that point of view. Um, but I think all the evidence pointed to this not being an Indian carving, uh, it not being something from frontier pioneer days. It was something later in time. Um, and I think there was some argue, some thought at the beginning that where was this rock at in relation, actually physically, was it more on the Kentucky side of the river, more on the Ohio side of the river, and there's a whole history associated with who owns the river, which is another interesting story. Um, but now I know clearly the rock was, heck, it was almost on the Kentucky bank. I mean, it was way over on the Kentucky side of the river. Um, but no, in the community, it was, it was more of a question of... Um, why are you taking this so seriously? Uh, this guy has actually brought something back to life that has been dead for a long time. Um, sure, it's not going to change the world, but it's something that we maybe should talk about and not fight about. Um, so you, I talked to Randy Nichols, great guy, great local Portsmouth historian, and uh, he was talking about some of the kind of events the city had to try to uh, raise yeah, well, once I once I bit, I bit hard, and uh, and we started doing what we could to to uh, let the people know about what was going on with the rock, and also make people have an appreciation for the history of the rock and and what it meant to Portsmouth, and the fact that it had been mentioned in the Portsmouth historic record. So uh, one thing we did was we tied it to the Fourth of July fireworks that I was part of at the time, and we did this rock festival. And the uh, rock festival had rock wall climbing and, and different activities where kids could win prizes. Uh, and we had a big rock, paper, scissor battle to kind of like for, for prizes and things as well. But it was an opportunity for people to learn about this rock and the importance of the rock. We also, uh, a little later, through the schools, um, had a writing competition for I think it was fifth graders or fourth graders to talk about their local history and to write stories about how they think the face got on the rock. And they really enjoyed that, and they re received some prizes. And actually, a few of the kids came up to the state house and presented some of their their writings to members of different committees uh, to to support a resolution that was going through by the Ohio House, urging Ohio and Kentucky to work together to try to find some kind of resolution to this. 
um, and to, to, to keep this in the, as a historic item that we should try to celebrate and not, like I said, fight about. Did you speak with any of the Kentucky officials at this point or any of the politicians about the rock and what could be done to help resolve this contentious yeah. issue? Yeah, I mean, at the very beginning in particular, uh, I was talking with a few state senators uh, over in Kentucky and trying to find a, a way to, because it, it, it went from like zero to 500 miles an hour in a very short period of time, and trying to find a way to kind of bring this back and find a happy solution to this. Um, and they were working with me initially, but then there were a few other members of the Kentucky legislature that were very serious about this and very adamant that this was a, something historically important and that it needed to be protected and that there was no room for negotiation, there was no room for compromise, there was no room for discussion. Um, and I think that faction kind of controlled the day because uh, that was, they saw that as very important to them and they wanted to, go, to push it as hard and as far as they could. Was that Reginald Meeks? Uh, Reggie Meeks, Louisville. <laughs> he also never, I don't think, ever traveled to the region to see anything. Yeah. It's one of the things that bugs me is a lot of these folks, the Heritage Council in Kentucky, the Native American Council, very few actually traveled to see it. Right, right, so, right. Um, why was Kentucky so adamant on charging Steve and his crew? And then the second part, it, it all was dropped whew, so quickly. Yeah, um... Why were they so adamant in charging them? I, I think, in a way, they were probably maybe a little bit embarrassed by it all, um, the, the way it had all kind of blown out of proportion. And once you kind of, once you're pot committed on something, and I sent them use a poker term, you kind of need to follow through on it. And I think they felt like they needed to follow through uh, because they originally started out with such a strong position that this was historically important. Uh, contrary to the evidence that came out, uh, and I shouldn't say it's not important. It is important, but it wasn't. It didn't fit the category of, of what they wanted when it comes to an antiquity um, or an, an Indian artifact. So, uh, but they still yet they had committed and they wanted to pursue that and, and force that through. Now, when it comes to why they dropped the charges, it it appears that there are several of these types of rocks in the Ohio River. Um, I guess prior to the internet, people had to have something to do. So whenever the river would get low and rocks would start to show themselves, people would go out and carve their initials or their names or faces or images or whatever else on these rocks. And there, not only were, was this rock there, but there were a few others in that very close area um, that fit the same description. So I think they actually, eventually had to drop the case because they really couldn't show that this was the Indian Head Rock. Yeah, and that's essentially what Duval, Cliff Duvall, who's retired now, and, and uh, he said that simply couldn't prove it. You know? <laughs> and he seemed—he was a pretty hard-edged guy in the in the uh, courtroom too. Mm -hmm. um, what were some interesting aspects about the rock and the trial and the media firestorm that happened uh, from the Portsmouth side? I know Steve Hartman came down and did a piece. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. Um, Everybody was probably a little bit surprised that it just continued to grow and continued to escalate. And that, you know, you had the New York Times, you had the CBS News, you had CBS Sunday Morning. It was just continual talk. I mean, people were coming up to me as their state representative and say, I was driving through Arizona a couple of weeks ago and they were, went through, stopped at this diner and they were talking about this fight about this rock. And uh, I personally thought, well, this is a, I mean, I hate that, that this is all going on, but also there is probably a way to ca capitalize on this uh, in the sense that it, that does have national exposure at this point. And that's really whenever I was trying very hard to work with uh, the legislative people in Kentucky, say, look, we have created this, rightly or wrongly, uh, sense of, uh, of interest in, in this rock. Um, let's capitalize on that and either find a way to resolve it that's unique, that people will look at and say, wow, this is a really good approach to, to solving problems, or continue the battle, but continue it in a way that's productive. Uh, but uh, like I said, there was really no interest in, in that, and uh, that was shot down pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed Hartman's piece, actually. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of my favorite parts of the news on Sunday morning. Yeah. He, he's an Ohio guy, right? He is. And, and at the time that was going on, his mom, I think, was going through some cancer. I don't know whatever happened with whether she made it through or, or what. But, yeah, he, 
he was always dealing with that issue too on the side. You could tell he was he was um, he had burdens on himself. And now I think you told me on the phone once when I called you back in June. Was there a rock paper scissors part of a festival, or was that well something you guys had talked about? Well, uh, one of the things that I had talked about and floated as a way to resolve this, outside of continuing litigation, was uh, you know it's a, this is kind of a silly problem, and sometimes silly problems deserve silly solutions. And and I thought, why don't we? Uh, one of the things I proposed was let's have a rock paper scissor battle. This could be something that we've got all of this national exposure now, like I said, rightly or wrongly. Um, let's line some people up on the Ohio side of the bridge and some Kentuckians on the Kentucky side of the bridge, and we'll just have our rock, paper, scissor battle, and whoever wins this thing, uh, whoever wins the battle will will get to keep the rock, either keep it forever or keep it for a year or two and maybe try it again. Uh, but historically, the communities in, in southern Ohio and northern Kentucky, that part of the state, we have things to do with each other, but not that much, really. I mean, uh, you would think there would be more of a cohesion there. No, I shouldn't. People marry each other across the river and all that, but and there's all kinds of Kentucky jokes on the Ohio side, and I'm sure there's all kinds of Ohio jokes on the Kentucky side. Uh, but we really don't have that much stuff going on together openly. And uh, I would think that may be a way for us to show solidarity and community and find a, a good solution to this that would involve something that may actually create some interest outside of the community, get people to come and visit and look at this beautiful rock that that is uh, so important to the history. I like that idea. I think that's a great idea. Um, yeah, the people in those areas don't really intermingle. No, I, mean, I don't really know a lot about that quadrant of Kentucky either. It's rural. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, it was interesting kind of being in that area this summer. Well, what was fun for, for me is as this was going on, I don't know, I became kind of like the, the, the spokesman on the issue, uh, and people were always coming to me with ideas. And a lot of people were saying, look, the, the Green Up football team and the Portsmouth football team, sometimes they play, but they don't play every year. Make that the, make that the deciding thing. Uh, some people escalated it to say, well, we ought to get the Ohio State football team in Kentucky to play. And then I had some Kentucky folks come up to me and say, "No, we don't want we don't want that. Let's play basketball instead." <laughs> so <laughs> have UK play Ohio State in basketball. So you know they were jockeying for position. So I appreciate that. Uh, we interviewed Randy Yowie, and uh, at that time Randy worked for WSAZ. He got a little uh, uh, legal trouble. I think he switched over to thirteen now. Okay. Um, uh, he uh, told us a story that uh, along with the local DJ. Mm -hmm. There was a, a funny April Fool's Day prank that got some folks upset. It, well, it got people excited. There was it was April first, um, I think it was two thousand and eight, uh, and I get a phone call early in the morning, um, and saying the the Kentuckians have stolen the rock, and and I was like, what? <laughs> I was just waking up. I mean, this was like six thirty in the morning, and uh, the, the, this, the Kentuckians have stolen the rock. So what are you talking about? It says Steve Hayes is the local DJ. Uh, there is talking all about it. That they came over in the night and they stole this rock. And Randy Yoey has been on the radio and they've talked this all through. Um, so I didn't know exactly what was going on. Did not put the April first together with it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Did not put the April first together with the whole issue. Um, so I called Steve directly at the radio station and said, "What in the world is going on?" And he explained to me that it was a April Fool's hoax, but he would love for me to go on the radio and kind of keep this going. He said, because the phone is just going crazy, people are talking. I mean, this is like the talk of the town that the Kentuckys have stolen a rock and they're wanting to you know, charge across the river. And I'm thinking, man, this is, <laughs> I can't believe this, but I told Steve, I said, sure, I'll play along, but I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm not going to say that this is true. I'm going to say if, if, if this is true, then we need to somehow find a resolution to this but anyway so he talked to me and we talked on the radio and uh, people were very fired up about it I received phone calls all morning long saying what are we going to do what are we going to do and then he finally broke broke that it was an April Fool's joke at 9 o'clock or 9 30 something like that but I was kind of glad he did it uh, just to, because it had really escalated people <laughs> were paying attention well, that's what <laughs> to what's going on radio he told us uh -huh. uh, so after the charges were dropped on Steve and his crew uh, primarily David Vedder uh, were you or your office notified about the rock being returned or taken over to Greenup? 
No, at that time, and I'm trying to remember when that actually happened. Um, a couple years after. It was a couple, yeah. I was not advised of, of that. I wasn't surprised. Because if you look at this whole situation from the very beginning, from the first day the rock was taken out of the river, the mayor of Portsmouth that day called over to the South Shore mayor, village council person, and said, look, they brought this over here. If you want it back, you can have it. Okay, so I mean, from the very beginning, there really wasn't a fight about about this. If people would have just let, the, I guess, the local community in a way kind of figure it out, um, and they'd already talked about that, and there was no question that it would be returned to Kentucky if if they wanted it back. Um, so uh, that was Jim Cobb, the, the the mayor of Portsmouth at the time, that that did that and called them right at the beginning. So I wasn't surprised that eventually that they, it was given back to Kentucky. I don't know if that's really the best solution in the sense because I don't think they really have a place to keep it or store it or, or to display it. Uh, some folks in Portsmouth, they were excited about the possibility of displaying it at various places. Historically, in the historic record back in the early 1900s, before the river was dammed, there was already a plan that the rock was going to be taken out of the river and moved to York Park, which is a park that fronts right on the riverfront there in Portsmouth because of the significance of the rock. And they were going to put it there. For whatever reason, that did not happen. I don't, I don't know exactly what happened. Um, uh, but that there has been a history of over 100 years that this rock would be in Portsmouth at some time, but it, it just never made it. It did yeah. for a little while. It did for a little <laughs> while, and then, and then it was taken back. Oh. <clears throat> One of the things, uh, the Green Up Judge Executive, I walked out there. Um, he, said, it's in, he said, I'll be over there shortly. You guys just go on over there and wait mm -hmm. for me. So we're poking around. and It was in a building that looked like... Uh, Hang on just a second. Hey, Rob. Good, man. Well, that's right. That's right. They can edit this out. <laughs> they can edit that part out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But uh, it was in what I would describe as a building that looked like where you stored feed for your cows or horses. Right. Um, a wooden structure. And I thought, with all of the stuff I had read and researched before seeing it, it was going to be it was going to be in a fa fairly secure area. Mm hmm. Yeah, this is important. This yeah, is important so I was artifact. looking around, I'm poking around, I'm looking in there like, oh, there's a tractor in here, oh, there's a backhoe in here. And there's one door left, and it's got a half of a, well, probably a quarter of a cinder block, mm -hmm. propping it shut. And I pull it back, no lock on the door. There it is, covered by blue tarp. Was there a light shining down on it? No, no, no light in the entire <laughs> building. Yeah. It was really hard to see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I was like, so I took the tarp off myself, and then the judge executive came over. I was like, there it is. You know, we got it right here. We had to cover it up. And I was, it was like seeing a the last buffalo, mm -hmm. but you couldn't get into an area to where you could appreciate it. Yeah. So we had to run probably 100 feet of extension cable to get a light in there so we could photograph it. So you can get to a picture of it. Yeah. yeah. And it was sad. It was sad that that is its home now. Yeah. And I don't think the average person could go see it if we didn't check with the judge. I don't know if you would go see it. Well, I know when it was in Portsmouth, we wanted to move it to the Welcome Center, but there was part of this whole civil lawsuit that was going on was that you can't move this. If you're going to move an artifact, it has to. there's a certain process you have to go through, and we hadn't done that, and they were adamant about us not moving the rock because it was in a garage in the Portsmouth City Garage. Um, and it got so big there for a while anytime somebody came to Portsmouth they wanted to see it and the the, the people over there at the city garage ended up they, they kind of knew and would send people to the right way I know my own self anytime one of my fellow state reps were traveling in the area or whatever they would always want to come see it Gordon Gee I think stopped by I know he stopped by and he wanted to, to see it uh, the former uh, OSU president uh, and others um, and so I, I have like a little scrapbook of all these different people that visited the rock in the, in the garage there in Portsmouth. But there was a move at that time to put it into the Welcome Center, but we were blocked because of, uh, of uh, legal concerns. Um, Bobby Carpenter, that judge executive, and the guy I don't I, I have no previous knowledge of him, just interviewed him. He um, kind of felt, what's the proper term here? 
almost tasked by the state mm -hmm. to do something with it. Yeah. And then, you know, Greenup County is a small county in Kentucky, and Kentucky doesn't always have the funds in the state uh, to do certain things. So he told us personally he would like to find a good home for it. And he talked about how it fell through to put it in Greenup County or uh, Greenbow State Park. Fell through, they were going to put it in South Shore at one point, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere close to the bridge over there. That fell through because of funding. And that's what he told us. He would like to find a good home for it. Where would a good home for that be, Todd, in your opinion? Well, in my opinion, and maybe it's because it was my idea from from the get beginning, was um, it's part of both communities. Uh, if there was some way that it could be shared by the communities, would probably be the best answer. Uh, one of the people talked about putting it on the bridge, um, you know, the, that connect the communities, and I thought that was not a bad idea. However, it'd be hard to see or get to because you're you know got some traffic. You may get run over in the process. Um, but the idea of somehow sharing it in a way, if it's a, if it's a friendly competition between the communities to decide who gets to keep it for the next year or two, um, that may not be a, be a bad way to, to resolve this. Right now, it's benefiting no one. Um, it's kind of just stuck over out of the way where no one can see it or have access to it. Uh, and um, it is something that's part of that community. It's been in the historic record for hundreds of years, and it's attracted attention for hundreds of years and I think there's a there's got to be a way that these communities can work together to, to try to continue that in a positive way there there's something about rocks I don't know what what it is but you look at from Mayflower to to even in Jerusalem and the different rock I mean we have a an interest in rocks and uh, it continues here and I think this is part of that history of, of this community of trying to find a way to, to now celebrate this history instead of fighting about it you know, we're coming up probably by the time we get this finished and, and ready to show, it'll be really close to 10 years of uh, when it was initially removed. But uh, what are your thoughts close to 10 years now after all this? Of course, you've, you've moved on from politics there in Southern Ohio and, and moved here to Columbus. What's your thoughts on it looking back on all this now? Well, looking back, uh, I have two thoughts really over overall one is I think it was a missed opportunity I think we had an opportunity and I shouldn't say it's lost it's a missed and maybe we can do it we can fix it and, and do it now uh, but we had an opportunity where people were focusing on the area and we could have found a, a unique way to resolve this uh, and benefit into the process I think the other thought is um, Steve Schaefer has, should be celebrated for bringing back to life some of the history that had been completely lost, completely forgotten, and uh, instead he was uh, turned into the bad guy and was trying to be portrayed as someone that was trying to, to do bad things, and really all he was wanting to try to do, I think, was fulfill uh, a commitment he made to himself as a kid to find this rock and then once he found it he was so excited about it he wanted to let everybody else know that it was out there and uh, uh, I don't think that's a bad thing I think the fact that he was trying to bring history back to life for the community is a, is a good thing and he should be celebrated and not looked at as a as a pariah. Yes Steve was such a gentleman with us working with us and I met with him several times that he would give us books and some of his personal effects to read to kind of know the knowledge behind it and, and uh, that's sort of what made me get a little apprehensive about some of the folks on the Kentucky side who never saw the rock. Mm -hmm. I was thinking mm -hmm. if you were that passionate about this battle, you, I think you would have drove to Portsmouth or even Green up and looked at it. Right, right. And, 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 and saw that there was no X's and moved on. <laughs> 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 and Steve told us, uh, he said he read about it as a little boy. You know, he was a yeah. young kid and he read about it and he was fascinated by it his mm -hmm. entire life and fascinated by rock art and, and the right. region. And uh, he was such a great guy. And, uh, you know, I love history, too. And I thought that was great that he knew so much history oh, about yeah. it. And then I realized very quickly <clears throat> how bad he got beat up in the process. Yeah. His head was full of this rock. I mean, he was, it was, he told me stories. He would come into the office and this was all going on. So you know, I think this thing's sending me signals, you know. <laughs> because it's all I can do is think about this and how we can try to resolve this. And and get this taken care of and uh, uh, but it was it was fun to, to talk with him and work with him through this uh, I think sometime in the future 
he'll be recognized, I think, for bringing this back to life. Um, I just hope that happens sooner rather than later. Yeah, and you can tell um, he's still very passionate about The Rock. Yeah. And uh, first time I talked to him, I figured he'd be extremely apprehensive. And I said, no, I think this is a very interesting story. And it's, you know, sort of the open here and the close is going to be this rock is in this county garage covered by a tarp and no one can see it. Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe there's a happy medium somewhere where people can actually appreciate it. Right. You know, after all of this. And you can tell he's still very passionate about it. Mm -hmm. I still got a ton of his uh, books I'm going to get back to him too but very nice man yeah. and he got beat up very badly mm -hmm. in this process and legal fees of course things sure. like that he had to pay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but he talked he talked about uh, the interview and the elation of when he found the rock yeah he looked for it I believe he told us five or six years well yeah I think he did some actual historical work and then yeah. he was in the river for a long time and mm -hmm. uh he somehow stumbled upon it was if you stood on Bond Street in Portsmouth, it was directly across from Bond Street. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the streets changed and Shawnee State's there now. And right. So Melly looked at he may locate. But uh, and he talked about the opposite when he found the charges were completely dropped. Mm -hmm. So from this initial elation of finding it to knowing he's not going to go to a federal <laughs> penitentiary. <laughs> yeah. Just the differences in emotion. And that was, I thought it was very touching. Mm -hmm. very was he touching. happy at the end or, or was he a little bit lost? Lost. Yeah. Uh, he was just kind of upset because, you know, he felt he, like you said, brought history back. And mm -hmm. he, he was the bad guy. Yeah. 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 So. yeah, I think all along it was a little disbelief on his part is how, why is this, why is this doing this? Why is this happening this way? Yeah, and I think Steve's a great guy. And mm -hmm. if anything, maybe the project <clears throat> can help people not just appreciate it, but think, wow, you really got beat up there mm -hmm. for a while. Yeah. Um, give us some closing thoughts here, Todd. Anything you want to say about The Rock or the future of The Rock? <clears throat> maybe some thoughts you could give to people who might would see this, who would think about the rock or the region. I mean, you know, in a project like this is going to have a niche, but there's still going to be a ton of people from the region saying it was just a rock. It's a big deal. Right, right. Well, you know, it is, it is just a rock. Um, but it's a rock that tells a story. And it's a rock that tells a story about a community and folks that live there and people, folks that thought it was important enough for them to row out to this to, out into the river to carve their initials or their their uh, images or whatever on this rock. So um, it's a, it's important that way. It's also important for I think the community uh, because it has a way or has the ability to bring us together and not divide us. And I think his, I think really the community's probably moved on in, in many respects. This is not something that they even talk about or are concerned with. But you still have this piece of history that was lost. Now it's found. Um, if there's a way to, to share that, we should do that. Um, my good friend Mark Twain said it's it's better to, to steal something to, than to let it lie around neglected. And we have this rock that's lying around neglected. Um, let's find a way to, to, to use it for a benefit. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Yeah, you were cut there.